Hello everyone and welcome to my first lesson in my programming course. If you're here to just learn how to do some programming, you want to learn about object-oriented programming, uh, then you've come to the right place. If you're here to learn more about game development, you're also in the right place, but you may want to take a look at my video of my uh, v game development roadmap. You can find resources such as which software to use and where to get uh, training tips and tutorials on those software in my roadmap video. So for example, 3D, I recommend Blender, but you can go to Blender Guru on YouTube and he's got some excellent tutorials. Check him out. Uh, check out the video if you want to see what other kinds of software and aspects of game development uh, are available to you and where to, st where to start, where to begin for each kind of aspect. So this portion of it is going to be for software development. I covered that in the previous video. Uh, today is probably going to be the most difficult and the most boring. I'm sorry, but it's just kind of the way it has to work. So you may notice that I've got a LibreOffice PowerPoint presentation thing open, but it's not in presentation mode. It's because I'm on a laptop. There's an issue with the graphics card. This is very common on laptops. OBS has not fixed it. And I don't care enough to really go ahead and fix it. I'm just going to record it like this. Sorry, it's not the best and most presentable way of doing things. But then again, I'm not an artist. I'm just a material provider, a information provider. So this is what we got. This is what we're going to deal with. All right, so let's just go ahead and dive into it. I don't want to waste too much time explaining the course, explaining this lesson or anything like that. So let's kind of just start. All right, today we're just going to look at computer hardware and software. And computers, uh, even though a lot of people want to look at programming, you need to know about how the computer is physically and software built physically and then runs hot on software. Uh, computers are made of a lot of different physical parts called hardware that work together to form one seamless machine. If you were to crack open your computer, you'd probably find tons, tons of little pieces in there. We're going to clear up some of it and kind of explain the different pieces of a computer so you understand kind of what's going on inside. This actually is really important to understanding how the software works as well. And it'll also be really important when you build programs for memory management and file access and blah, 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 blah. So let's break it down into three basic parts. There's the CPU, there's memory, and there's I.O. Let's start with the CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit and is the brain of the computer. The most common way of measuring a CPU's speed is clock rate. So you guys have gone to, if you guys ever look at some CPUs, you probably notice that some of them have, you know, one gigahertz or Hopefully it's a lot higher than one gigahertz, but you might have seen gigahertz. A hertz, a hertz is one cycle per second. It's one of something happening per second. In our case, in our case, it's one calculation per second. That's an extremely slow clock rate. That's why modern CPUs can work on the gigahertz range, which means one gigahertz is one billion instructions per second. Right, so. Frequencies are often between 2 to 4 gigahertz these days, but this is not necessarily the best way of ex describing a CPU's speed because the cache size, which is a, a small chunk of memory that is dedicated for the uh, dedicated and built into the CPU, that could be important as well. How many layers there are, how big it is, how fast it is, how many cores are inside of it plays a role as well. So you might see like an i9 on the side. You may actually see that some i9s have lower clock rates, but they are rated at faster speeds or rated in general to be faster and better because of the extra cores inside of it, right? So it's not always just about the clock rate. It's a kind of a combination of a whole bunch of different things. Clock rate just happens to be what we typically compare CPUs to other CPUs of the same type. So for example, an Intel four core processor versus maybe another Intel four core processor or an AMD four core processor, right? Usually comes down to cache size uh, and clock rate. So the word size, uh, before we go into word size, we need to understand that computers think in zeros and ones. Physically, this is a transistor turning from off to on. Off is zero, on is one, etc. 
because of this two number system, that's why it's called binary, meaning two numbers, a bit is either a zero or a one, right? A bit is called a binary digit. That's where it gets the name bit from, it stands for binary digit. Modern computers can handle up to 64 bits at a time. So when I said that there are 1 billion instructions, each instruction is going to be 64 bits long. So 64 zero to ones every single cycle. And there's 1 billion cycles per second. Well, 2 to 4 billion cycles per second. Anyways, the size that a single core can handle, in this case 64 bits, modern like modern ones, that's called the word size. So when you see, like, if you ask, like, hey, how big is your CPU's word size? It's probably 64 bits. There are some old devices that still exist out there that are 32 bits, but they're mostly obsolete. And then cores. So the clock, a single core is what executes instructions. So you have, let's say, on an i7, right, you have four cores. Each core can process 64 bits at a time, and it does so from two to four billion times a second. Okay? So you can kind of quadruple the number to get how much exact throughput you get per second or whatever, but how much data it can go through theoretically at any given time. But that's basically how a CPU works. You have multiple, you have like maybe four cores, each core has a 64-bit word size and runs at 2 to 4 gigahertz a second. All right. Then you have the memory. There are two types of memory, and it's, they're called primary and secondary memory, but don't get hung up on that. Basically, what you need to understand is that primary memory is called short-term memory. This is very, very fast, very, very small but does not retain the information. Well, that's kind of weird because it's called memory. That's because it's temporary memory. So think about the RAM. You, most people have heard of the word RAM, random access memory. It's called RAM because, or it's called random access memory because it takes the same amount of time for a CPU to access any address or any location inside the memory, right? RAM tends to be very, very fast, but a lot smaller than you know secondary memory and it cannot hold the memory. That's why it's called volatile memory. It cannot hold it. So, for example, this may this looks like a uh, laptop memory, laptop RAM, and this could be like one, two, three, four, eight sticks of one gigabit gigabytes of RAM. So this could be an eight gigabyte stick of RAM, right? This looks like it's for a laptop because it's exposed. It's very flat. It's very compact. This is definitely for a desktop PC. It's a little bit bulkier probably higher performance than this and it looks very stylized which is a lot of things that gamers like to do is they stylize their uh, their memory and their their components inside the vehicle or not the vehicle inside the computer all right secondary memory is what we're mostly used to right you have your long-term memory it's your storage device, very, very large, but very, very slow. And it's non-volatile because it doesn't erase. Like if I power down my computer, the memory is still there. So this is an example of what a one terabyte external, I'm sorry, internal hard drive looks like. This is also that same hard drive. Well, probably the same hard drive, but the top shell is completely removed just to show you kind of what's inside of it, but you would never purchase it. And I do not recommend you remove the face at all. If you do say goodbye to all your data, because even a slight piece of dust will destroy it. Okay. One terabyte is a thousand gigabytes, right? Your memory in your computer is probably eight to 16 gigabytes. So I'm talking about the Ram. When I say memory, I usually mean Ram. When I say hard drive, if I say storage, I usually mean like your hard drive. So these are, this is going to be our distinction between memory in RAM versus uh, hard drive and storage. So hard drive and storage are the same. Memory and RAM, we'll call them the same. I'm going to use memory and storage mostly. Common examples, hard drives, USB sticks, CDs. All right, so here is a motherboard. So let's talk about some inputs and outputs. Basically, you can consider just about anything an input and an output, but when we say input and output, what we usually mean is 
an input or an output to something that's outside the computer or outside the CPU or the motherboard. So yes, technically the graphics card takes is an input device as you know it takes in input from memory, which is like the visual data, and then outputs it to the monitor. But the monitor is going to be basically just your output device, right? So that's an example of an output device. Your mouse and keyboard are input devices. And everything on this board is basically both, right? It's splitting hairs, not really important. So I don't really want to drag too much on it. Uh, GPU kind of acts as both motherboard peripherals. Let me move this since it's a broken slide. Since OBS can't deal with two graphics cards on a single computer. All right, inputs and outputs, GPU, motherboard, peripherals, mouse, keyboard, monitor, audio devices, etc. All right, so let's put the pieces together. I'm actually going to draw this out so we can have, so we're not staring at a PowerPoint the entire time. Let's draw this out. Let's start with the motherboard. Let's say you have a motherboard. By the way, the only purpose a motherboard really serves is to connect all the pieces together, right? As complicated as this picture looks, all it is is a bunch of copper wires that connect to each other. And these like little circular things like over here and over here, these are uh, capacitors and you got resistors all over the plates. But all it does is connect the CPU to memory, like the memory is connected to, to the CPU, which is right here, CPU. These are the, where you would insert memory sticks. This is where you would probably put the uh, graphics card and maybe a, uh, a, like a high performance network card over here or something like that. But all it does is connect everything together, all right? There's some uh, ATX pins for power or where's the, these pins would probably connect you to your hard drive. Anyways, the entire point of this whole thing is to connect everything together. That is the only point of a motherboard. Nothing fancy. I mean, it looks fancy. It looks complicated, and it, it kind of is. All this stuff here is just to make sure that the signals go from one place to the other place without degrading or becoming noisy or anything like that. So here's our magical motherboard. So the CPU, let's start with the CPU. The CPU is just the brain of the entire thing. C P oh. C P U. The CPU is the uh, the brain of the computer. Next, we're gonna load in some RAM, and we'll just I'll just say that this is our RAM or our memory. Memory, not storage. Memory. So this is our RAM. Maybe somewhere else in the computer, outside of it, but still connected to it, is a hard drive disk, which is the type of disk, the type of storage hard drive that you saw before with the disks inside of it, or a solid state drive. And this will be connected to some sort of pin on the outside of the computer. Okay. And then maybe we have like a GPU here. G, P, U, right? So maybe you've got some connections here, some connections, oops, probably some connections here, connections here, all right, connections here, and so on. Here's what happens. Let's say that somewhere inside, well, actually, when you power up the CPU, the first instruction it has is to load an operating system, right? Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever. This has to go to the solid state drive or the X, the hard drive and say load operating system, right? One way or another. So the operating system will get loaded into memory and it takes some time, but it starts dumping all the files into memory. And eventually you'll have your operating system OS. Let's say that you have a text document on here, a word document or a PowerPoint. When you you will have a saved copy of the PowerPoint here. When you open it on your desktop, the document gets pushed into memory and you start editing it. This is what you edit while you're typing. But that's only where the edited copy is. If you shut your computer down, remember that this is non-vol this is volatile memory. 
So if you lose power and you didn't save, it's gone because you have not saved it. In other words, written it back to the, to the hard drive. That is why you'll notice that a lot of software now um, they have like auto saving features. It's to prevent you from losing your paper or documents or whatever while you're editing them. If you, especially if you forget to save it actively, this is how they recover documents is they noticed that a lot of people were losing documents. Like, Oh crap, I didn't save and I lost power. Well, it's okay. They usually backed it up for you, but this is why you have to save and save frequently. What we're going to do in this programming class is we're essentially going to be doing the same thing. Technically, when you program, all you do is you edit some files. We'll edit them here when we compile, which we'll learn about what that is in a minute. When we compile and save, it'll get stored on the solid state drive. When you run an application such as a video game or something like that, or well, even Microsoft Office, you know, some of the data is going to get streamed between the CPU and the memory, and some of it's going to go to the GPU so that the user can see where the document is visually. Because in memory, it's just floating around in some spot. I mean, the CPU knows where it is, the GPU knows where it is, but it's a floating around in memory. And the monitor is just a graphical way of representing its position. All right, so here's some, let's talk about software. We, that, that should be enough of the hardware. Programs and data that are executed by the computer, uh, such as the operating system, are software. The three biggest operating systems for desktops and laptops are Windows, Linux, and Mac, or the Mac OS, like iOS, whatever. Uh, is iOS? No, iOS is the mobile, uh, mobile software. So here is the logo for Windows, these three, uh, four, actually. These two are Mac, and this is actually Linux, Tux, uh, Tux the Penguin. So these are the logos for each one of those. There are pros and cons to each one. Windows is probably the most popular because of businesses and gaming. Mac is a close second for, you know, just popular amongst uh, the everyday usage. Linux is the least popular, but that's because it's probably just because it's the most difficult to use. However, out of all three of those, it's the only one that's free. It is completely free, community developed, open source, which means open source means that uh, anyone is allowed to really edit it, but only official edits can be uploaded to a server for whatever reason. Uh, and then for mobile phones, you have Android and iOS. That's pretty much it. Okay, so some software that's a little bit more relevant to us is a compiler. We're about to learn something about how the different languages work or how language itself works. And a compiler is a program that converts our human readable code. We have to type in something that's readable to a human. We're going to convert our human readable code down to machine readable code, all the way down to the zeros and ones. Sort of for our case, but you'll see what I mean by that. Some common desktop applications, Microsoft Word, Windows Media Player, any video game, and IDEs. I covered what IDEs were in the previous video. If you want to know what that is, go take a look. And some web browsers are some very common software also. Uh, this image right here is a group of free software that I sometimes use myself, such as this is Blender. This is used for 3D rendering. And what we're going to eventually use for the game development course. Oops, didn't mean to hit the page. You've got GIMP, which is essentially the Linux version of Photoshop. Uh, Audacity, which is just the audio recording software. Linux operating system, LibreOffice, which is what I'm using right here. It's the free alternative to Microsoft Office. And Java is the programming language we're going to be using. It's a free programming language. And there are others here, but I think that those are going to be the ones that are going to be most relevant to most of you. Okay, languages. When we think about languages, English is called the highest level language. Well, not English itself, but spoken language is considered the highest form of language. It's very complex. For us, it's very easy to understand, but it's very complex in the actual structure of it. If you actually look at how complex spoken languages are, it's incredible. 
right? We have all these alphabets and words, entire dictionaries, etc. The lowest and simplest language is binary. It's it's complex to us because it's not easy for us to convert English to binary, but it's the simplest because it only has two values, right? Uh, we have an entire alphabet, but the binary alphabet is just zero and one, which isn't really an alphabet, obviously. I understand that it's just a number. But that's all it is, just two values, zeros and ones. So we kind of need to start somewhere in the middle, which is why if you see here, it says written programming languages, C++, Java, C Sharp, and Fortran. We're going to be learning Java, but not because we're going to learn Java, and i got to make that clear. We're not really learning Java. I mean, we are learning Java, but we're learning Java to understand object-oriented programming. Once we have a good grasp on object-oriented programming, we're going to start jumping to other languages to, show you, to show you just how much you actually have learned. But also to show you that, yeah, we didn't actually learn Java. We learned object-oriented programming. So as I said before, we are going to need a compiler to get us down to the binary. But let's look at the way that languages convert to machine code differently. In C and C++, and possibly C Sharp, I think C Sharp Let's leave that one out of the way because that's a little bit different. C and C++, what you're going to do is you're going to write the code and completely compile it down to machine code. So the green here is what you do when you're developing. And then this is what happens. The gray is what happens during execution. It's actually a light blue. Okay. So for C, we'll write the code and we compile it. When we compile it, it is completely machine ready code. The, I'll come back to why this is good and why this is bad. Interpreters such as Python, Python is an interpreted language. When you type in Python, that's it, you're done. You save it, that's the code that you've written. When you run the code, an interpreter has to be run to translate it to machine code on the fly. Okay, that is the difference. Here we're putting it all the way down to the machine code right off the bat. Here, we're turning it into machine code as we execute. The pros and cons of each are C and C++ are going to run a hell of a lot faster than Python, especially as applications get bigger. For tiny applications, I bet they're probably going to be very similar. But for larger applications, larger programs, C and C++ are going to be a lot faster. That's why C++ is still the primary language used for massive video games because the other languages probably can't keep up since they have to be interpreted. So, I mean, C-sharp's doing pretty well, but even it has its limitations. Uh, it's not as high performance as C++. So, so pros and cons of this. The pros, as I, I said, it's extremely fast. There, there is no translating. It just runs on the CPU directly. The problem is it matters what CPU it runs on. Because if I run it, if I compile code for Intel or AMD CPU, I have to compile it twice. Once for Intel, once for AMD. Uh, in reality, I, from what I understand, it's more based on whether or not you're running it on Linux or Windows, I believe. Because that's what you're actually sending the instructions to. You're sending it to the operating system. We don't need to get into that. But, you know, I, it, it, it makes the compiling part a lot harder. Because now if I'm if I needed to output different machine code for different types of machines, then I have to either rewrite or recompile or do a bunch, make a bunch of changes so that it complies with every type of CPU that's out there. It's usually Windows versus Linux, not actually the CPU. It's not too much of the issue. The pros of Python is it makes it very easy to operate. You just have to have Python on the computer that's going to run your code but most computers have Python nowadays anyways. Uh, so I think, so I believe. So it makes the development part very, very simple, but it makes the execution a little bit slower, right? Because the interpreter has to convert it into machine code as it runs. So now the interpreter is doing two things. It's converting and executing code at the same time. For C and C++, it's just running the code. It does not have to translate. So Java does a little bit of both, and that's one of the interesting things about Java. What we're going to do is we're going to type Java code, and the compiler is going to compile to bytecode, and this is done all during development. The bytecode is a lower level than what Python is, 
So what it means is it has less translating to do because the interpreter can go from here, like maybe four or five steps before it gets down to the machine code. What we're going to do is we're going to compile it down maybe two or three steps. And then the just-in-time compiler, that's what JIT stands for, just-in-time compiler is basically an interpreter, is going to translate it one or two steps down to binary, making it faster than Python, but not as fast as Java, uh, C and C++. So that's how Java has combined these two things together. So what does this mean, though, for Java? This means that you can write it once and run it anywhere. Because you can write it once, just like in Python, because we're interpreting it down to byte, Java bytecode. But the computer you run it on has to have a Java runtime environment or Java virtual machine. If it doesn't have it, it can't run your program. But that's not a problem because Sun Microsystems, I think, is the one who, I think it's Sun Microsystems, uh, they have Java runtime environments for every platform out there. And most machines have Java on it already anyway, so running it isn't a problem each individual Java machine. So one company made all these Java virtual machines and JREs for all these different computers. And that's all you need to worry about. As long as you got the right Java version, you're good to go. Okay, let's do a little binary today. Just today. Okay, this is going to be the most boring and difficult part of this whole thing. But I'm sorry, and I hate PowerPoints, I hate presenting them, I hate making you watch them. I promise I will try to do as much dr shitty drawing as I can, but I'll try to step away from uh, PowerPoint presentations more and more as time goes forward. Okay, computers think, in z computers think in zeros and ones called binary. A single binary digit is called a bit, a zero and a one. One binary digit is a bit, eight binary digits, 8 bits equals 1 byte, right? Two or more bytes equals a word, and the word is very loosely used, to be honest with you, but it's usually dependent on the CPU size. Uh, an example byte would be 10011011 in binary, which is equivalent to 155 in decimal. All right. So let's look at the data sizes. I don't want to get too hung up on here, but if you're converting, if you're talking about a byte in base two, you get 1,024 bytes is one kilobyte. But in base 10, which is what most of us are familiar with, it's 1,000 bytes, 1,000 kilobits, 1,000 kilobytes for every, it is 1,000 bytes for every kilobyte. Thank you, sorry. So it's 1,000 bytes per kilobyte, a thousand kilobytes per megabyte, a thousand megabytes per gigabyte, and a thousand gigabytes per terabyte. Right? Be careful when you see capital B versus a lowercase b. So it's capital M B is a megabyte, but a capital M lowercase b is a megabit, which is approximately eight times smaller. This actually should be exactly eight times smaller. One way to look at this is if you ever look at your data rates um, when you download something or when you are quoted data rates for internet service providers like Comcast or RCN or Time Warner or whatever it is, you'll notice that they usually stick to kilobits or megabits per second. That's because if you had like 80 megabits per second, that's only eight megabytes per second. And that's like not that fast. It's kind of fast. It's good enough for most applications, but it's not really that fast. Uh, for downloads, for anything else, but they get to use a bigger number. They get to say it's 80, right? It sounds bigger, it sounds cooler, and it's a marketing thing. Some people do use megabit and megabyte for accuracy sake, but for the most part, we're going to stick to kilobytes. Operating systems typically work in uh, base 2, so they'll use kilobit, like the 1024 system. But hardware manufacturers like that's why you'll see like hardware, like you'll see a 500 gigabyte operating system. I'm sorry, 500 gigabyte hard drive on sale. But when you actually connect it to your computer, it says like 468 gigabytes. It's actually converting from base 10, which is the 500 gigabytes down to base two, which is the 486 or seven gigabytes. I forget what it is off the top of my head. 
Anyways, if you really want to know more about converting from uh, base 2 to base 10, you can look at it on Wikipedia. Don't get too caught up on this section. It's something that bothers a lot of people, but for the most part, we're not going to worry about it. Just focus on the fact that what a binary digit is and that there's 8 bits per byte. 8 bits, 1 byte, smallest value you can have. Well, it's smallest in the CPU. We'll get to that in a second. So before we get any further with the binary and bits and bytes, etc., let's just kind of count in decimal, binary, and hexadecimal. There's a reason I'm having you do hexadecimal in a second. Uh, hexadecimal is actually very common in low-level languages, but it's also extremely common in image processing or dealing with images. I wonder if paint.net will have it. So if, let's say it's paint or paint. Yeah, there we go. Uh, edit colors, maybe, right? No, these are going to be edit custom colors. Hmm. I was really hoping it would have something, but uh, red, green, blue, these colors that you see here, these will actually usually be represented in hex code. And we're going to see how that kind of plays into this. So let's first count in decimal, just to 15. So if we start off, Oops, I'm in the wrong application. Uh, let's create a new one because we're going to do some counting. All right. This might sound stupid, but trust me, I have a point to this. I promise. Uh, we start with zero. And that might seem like a weird place because most people say if you start count to 15, you can start with one, right? But you should actually start with zero. Think of a stopwatch. Does a stopwatch start at one? No, it starts at zero. So if we do one, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So zero through nine, these are the first nine value, or first 10 values in the first digit. Now we're out of space. So if we add one more, we have to go to the next digit and then this goes resets back to zero. This is how counting works. So 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Let's make this a little bit better. Okay. All right. This seems pretty simple, right? You can, decimal, meaning 10, deci, 10, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 0 through 9 are the first 10 values that the first digit can hold. Then we add 1 to the second digit, and then we start counting over again. But we're going to stop at 15, just so we're not here all day. All right, let's do this in binary though, right? We'll start with zero, right? But then let's add one, we just get one. But if binary can only hold two values, zero or one, that means just like when we went from nine to 10, we have to carry on to the next digit and then reset this one back to zero. So this is zero, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to make it so squiggly. Zero one, two. And then if we add one again, we get, this is three in binary. Now we're out of space, so we just add one and then we just reset these to zero. This is three in binary, I'm sorry, four in binary. Five, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yep, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, oops, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. This is, uh, this is half a byte. This is actually kind of why I wanted you to stop. I don't want to go all the way up to eight bits. Uh, the actual, the next part is also why we're going to stop at 15. So these are 16 digits, or sorry, not 16 digits, 16 numbers, right? This is how you count up in binary. Now, on a CPU, the minimum size is eight bits for one byte. So all we have to do is to actually represent a byte is just pad the left with zeros. It would be like saying, I just want to put some zeros over here. Does it change the value? No, it's still 15. We just never really use this. It just We just omit it. But computers can't omit it because that's the smallest you can get is eight bits. You have to have at least eight bits. So if you had a 64-bit number, but you wanted the number 15, you'd have to put uh, 60 zeros to the left because the computer has to have something there. 
All right, and then we would do this for all of them, but I'm not going to sit here and actually convert. Okay, cool. <clears throat> now, this is very simple, especially with 0 through 9. This is what we're used to. 10 digits or 10 values in the first digit. What about hexadecimal? Hexadecimal allows you to put 16 values in the first digit. How the hell do we do that? Let's count. I'm going to do it over here this time. So this is decimal. This is binary. And this is hex. By the way, in computing, what you'll often see, you'll see a 0x uh, and then like a number, right? Um, sorry, uh, I meant to put a number there. So let's say it was 0x15, right? This is a hexadecimal value of 15, which we'll actually see what that means in a second, because it's not 15. So the first value is going to be 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So what do we do after 9, right? We still have to be able to fit 16 values into the first digit. Let me fix this. OK, what are we going to do? Because we st we still have to stay in the first digit, so what are we going to do? What we decided to do, although somebody decided to do at one point in time, is to just use the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, and uh, F. So then after F, so this is equivalent to 15, by the way. So let's draw some arrows. So F is equivalent to 15, which is equivalent to 1111. So just like we did when we go to 9, we have to reset the first digit. So we're going to go down to 0, and then we're going to carry 1 over to this value. So 1, 0 is actually 16 in hexadecimal. Oh, I'm sorry, in decimal. And then, you know, 1, 1, 1, 2, all the way down to whatever. That means if F is equivalent to 15, and 15 is equivalent to four ones, that means to have in binary, let me just go down here. In binary, we have one, 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 right? This would be equivalent to the maximum value a byte can hold, which is 255. And then in hexadecimal, this is simply F, F. That's one of the big reasons that some people like to use hexadecimal is because it's two characters, or in other words, two digits to represent one whole byte. In an image, FF is a white pixel. 00, zero is a black pixel. 0 is the bottom. 255 is the maximum in decimal, right? So you have 0 through FF, or 00, zero through FF, and then 0 through 255, 256 values per byte. Bam. That might have gone a little bit fast, but feel free to rewind and uh, re-listen to this if you want to kind of understand how this works, at least the counting portion of it. Just the counting. So let's move on to the next part. Let's convert a number to decim from decimal to binary. And it actually turns out to be very, very simple. The process is basically this. You start with a number, any number. You divide it by 2. You get a quotient. And then you get a quotient, an integer quotient. And then what you do is you carry the remainder over here. Since we're dividing by 2, the only two types of remainders we can get are 0 and 1. This is how we kind of break it down mathematically from decimal to binary. And we keep going all the way until we get to 0, or actually a 1. So let's go ahead and let's do some, let's start another one. And let's convert the number 37 to binary. So 37 divided by 2 is 18, right? 18 with the remainder of 1. Because this 18 times 2 is 36 plus 1, 37, right? 18 divided by 2 is 9, remainder 0. 9 divided by 2 is uh, 4, remainder 1. 4 divided by 2 is 2, remainder 0. 2 divided by 2 is uh, 1, remainder 0. And 1 divided by 2 is uh, 0, remainder 
1. So now that we're at 0, we can stop. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write this from top to bottom, right to left. So this is actually 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now remember I said we have to have 8 bits at least. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I'm just going to pad the left with zeros. And there you go. There's our binary digit. Or there's our binary numerical value for 37. That's all you have to do. Divide by 2 until you get to a quotient of 0. Whoops. Divide by 2 until you get to a quotient of 0. Then write it from top to bottom, right to left. He did it from bottom to top, left to right. I don't like doing that, but feel free. Then once you're done, fill in the left, pad the left. All right, so let's go back the other way. This may look like a confusing equation, but it's actually pretty simple. Let's look at just this kind of first part. The, the key here is like you start with a binary number, 1010. Zero, zero. All you have to do to convert it back to decimal is do 1, or the value of the digit, times 2 raised to the power of the position. So if you notice that the power over here, the exponent over here, is a 0, because this is the zeroth index, it's called. Zero-based indexing, we'll get to that eventually when we talk about arrays. So this is zero-based, it's a zeroth uh, uh, position of the bit, which I know it sounds weird, zeroth, but that's what it is. This is the first, second, and third position, zero, one, two, three. Two to the zero, two to the first, two to the second, and we're just going to add, multiply it by the value, so one, zero, zero, one, uh, zero, one, zero, one, and then we're just going to add each uh, product together. We're going to add the product of this plus this plus this, and it equals 10. So let's go ahead and reverse this and start with our number. We know it's going to get to 37, but let's kind of uh, do the math to explain it out, right? So we have, I'm going to start with this one, which is the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, fifth position. 1 times 2 to the fifth plus 0 times 2 to the fourth plus 0 times 2 to the third plus 1, because of this 1, times 2 to the second plus 0. Oops, man, I am not used to writing on a touch screen. Plus 0 times 2, plus the screen is sitting upright. 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the zeroth. All right. This product, this one, and this one are just going to equal 0 because anything times 0 is 0. So I'm going to actually just kind of ignore those. This one is not multiplied by 0. It's raised to 0, but you'll see what that is. If you're not very good with math, it's fine. 1 times 2 to the fifth. I'd like to rewrite it just to clean it up. 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the zeroth power. All right. Any number raised to the power of 0 is 1. And 1 times 1 is 1, so that's just 1. 2 to the second power is 4. 4 times 1 is 4. 2 to the fifth power is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. 32 times 1, 32. 32 plus 34, oh, sorry, 32 plus 4 is 36, plus 1 is 37. There you go. That's it. That's all you got to do. Okay, so I'm not going to make you guys do too much more. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Feel free to rewatch this. I know I'm going a little bit fast, but I'm trying to keep this under an hour or approximately at an hour. To represent a negative number, so far what we've been doing is using a bit from 0 to 255, right? That's, a, that's what one byte is holding, 0 to 255. But what about negative numbers, right? What if I wanted to do uh, negative 27, right? The way that we do this in a computer is what we do is we two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We now convert this to be the signed bit. 
What this means is if it's a zero, the following is a positive number. If it's an, a one, the following is a negative number. Right, so we now can do negative numbers. As long as that last bit, all the way on the left, the most significant digit it's called, is either a zero or a one. It's a zero positive, one is negative. Okay, so how do you calculate the negative number? You don't have to worry about identifying it in the computer. The computer will know whether or not it's supposed to be positive or negative. Uh, when we get to variables, it should become a little bit more apparent because you have to define what it is before you actually create a variable. To find the negative number, oh, by the way, when we use this last bit, it's called a signed integer. In this case, we're going to be doing signed integers. Uh, you can do something in programming where you define your variable to be u int, which is unsigned, which means uh, this is not going to val determine whether or not it's positive or negative. It's actually going to influence when it's a number, right? But look what this does. When we get rid of this number, we can no longer use this as a number. It's just the signed bit. That means we actually are left with seven bits for a numerical value. The weird thing is we can still get 256 values, but now they're from negative 128 to positive 127. It almost seems as if there's more negatives than positives, but that's because zero is actually going to be considered a positive number in most cases. In reality, zero doesn't isn't positive or negative, but in computing, it's a positive number. So to find negative numbers, you have to do what's called the two's complement. First, calculate what it is, the positive representation of the number in binary. You flip all the bits. All that means is that, you know, once you write it out in, as a positive number, you turn all the zeros to ones and all the ones to zeros. It's that simple, that's it. Then you just add one, right? So let's find negative 37. Let's actually go back. I want to go back to that. Where was that? Let's find negative 37. We know that 37 is, uh, let's see, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Let's find negative 37. We already know what the first, uh, the positive value of it is. So this is in positive numbers. Then what we do is we flip all the bits, right? So this is step one. Write it out in binary po as a positive. Step two is to flip the bits. Step three, add one. So all we have to do is add one to this value, and then we can leave everything else the same. And this is our number. This is negative 37 as a binary digit, or as sorry, as a byte. Very fast, very simple, very easy. Okay. So convert negative 122 to binary. First, find positive 122. Right, the solution to the right only has seven bits. You add the eighth by padding the left. So you put a little zero right here. That's what I did over here. You flip all the bits, flip them, and you add one. OK, that's it. No more math. No more talking about it. No more numbers. No more zeros and ones. Uh, so using integers is obviously going to be a lot of what we do in programming, luckily. But you are going to run into cases where you're going to need a decimal point. In, in programming, a decimal is nine times out of 10 going to be a fixed, oh, I'm sorry, a floating point number. So what the hell is a floating point number? Let's say you had the number 400 million, but you didn't want to, or 800 million, but you didn't want to represent it as you know eight and then a whole bunch of zeros. Right on a piece of paper, what you wanted to do is represent it as 8.0 times 10 to the, is that 8? I think so. Uh, 10 to the 8th, whatever it is. That's a floating point number. The decimal is not where it kind of should be. It should be all the way at the end of the, the, the number, right? 800 million. But we floated it to the left and then represented it as a decimal. 8.0 times 10 to the whatever. That's exactly what, like, if you're used to scientific no notation, scientific notation is a very specific form of floating point values. Specifically, scientific notation is when you have the decimal right after the, the number, the first or the, the most significant digit, and then everything else gets placed to the right of it, and then you do times 10 to the power of whatever to, you know, show you how much you moved that decimal point. 
uh, this is how a decimal number is represented in binary. The very, very leftmost bit is the signed bit. It's always going to be, there's no, I don't think there's any such thing as an unsigned floating point variable. Uh, then the next five, eight or 11 bits are used as the exponent up here. And the last number is called the significant or the, uh, the significant. Don't worry about mantissa. It's this part, right? 6,235. I mean, the decimal is going to be here, but it's just 6,235. And this is what it looks like in binary. Okay, it gets complicated. You don't need to know that. But, you know, basically the idea is computers know how to look at different things and different, represent data in different ways. You don't have to worry about that specifically on the computer, but you do need to understand what a floating point number is and what a integer is and signed and unsigned bits. Because believe me, signed and unsigned is going to come up quite a bit in programming. So the more things you can do with binary, these are called binary operators. So bitwise and will, I don't want to, we'll talk a lot about these kinds of operators when we talk about like uh, if statements and logic. But if you do like, um, if you give me like the number 37 and a number 38, the result will be a bit for bit comparison. So let's say that I had negative 37 and 37. Right, and I did an AND operator on it. What it does is the result is actually going to be a 1 if and only if both of the digits are 1. So in this case, this will actually be a 1. These two are different, therefore it doesn't count. These two are different, doesn't count. These two are different, I've worked it crooked as hell. These two are different, 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 different. So 30, negative 37 and 37 turns out to be 1. When you AND them together, it's a weird thing to do. Sometimes you usually don't need to do it, but sometimes you might want to. I actually have used it once in a program I built, but it was for an industrial application, and they needed to do this thing very specifically. Uh, actually, what I used was the bitwise shift right method. What I did was I used the I used what's called like a eight bit and I and you know, a number down to a byte, and then I, I output the byte, and then I shifted the rest of the numbers right. It, it, you can get all kinds of crazy things in here, but just know that all you do with the bitwise shift left, bitwise shift right, is you're literally taking the byte or the numbers and you're shifting them. Now, what about the bits on the ends, the beginning or the left, when you shift left or right? They will typically be padded with zeros. That could be a bad thing sometimes, so you gotta be careful. Or I think they're actually padded with ones. You should probably Google that because that's not something that I usually deal with. But if you do three arrows to the right, it will shift it to the right and pad the left with zeros. All right, so here's some exercises that I give to you. Convert 12 to binary, convert negative 12 to binary. Using only one byte, calculate 255 plus 1. All right, so we're using an unsigned hint. Assume the byte is unsigned and do this in binary and see what happens. Uh, I will give you the answer. I will pause it, let you try it, and then I'll give you the answer. Uh, convert 53 to hexadecimal. Convert 25 to hexadecimal and use bitwise and operators to find 5 and 6. I think you can do... I will do this one with you guys right now. But let me first talk about this one. So go ahead and pause it if you want to try it. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. So 255 in binary, let's get you all the way out of the way, is all ones. Right, I have eight ones. So what happens when I add one to 255? We can only use a byte. That was one of the stipulations in the problem. I can only use a byte. Well. If I do 1 plus 1, that's 0, and then I carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, and I carry the 1. So this actually keeps going. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Ah, stop doing that. 5, 6, 7, 8. So I have all my 8 bits. I have to carry the 1 over here, but now it's gone. I can't. It's outside my limitation because I can only use 8 bits. right? So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I thought I was missing 1. 8. Well, this actually seems this actually is our answer. It's zero. 
because we've hit a ceiling. 255 for a single byte is our maximum value. If I add one to it, 255 goes all the way back down to zero. This is called overflow. When you when you count up or you go up so high, you actually go back down, right? There's a website called Stack Overflow that I mentioned in the last video. This is kind of where it comes from. It means that you filled up the stack so much that it overflowed and either, what that really just means is that you hit some memory kind of ceiling, but you know, with data overflow, it means that you've gone so high that you've gone back to this, the beginning. So if I had a signed bit and I was at 128, and I added one, it's actually negative 127. Because the maximum for a signed byte is 128. If I add one, I go all the way down to negative 127. The same thing is true if you go the other way. If I take zero, zero minus one is actually equal to 255. That's called underflow. Un I have to stabilize my stupid monitor. Underflow. Nope, just zoom out, computer. Thank you. Underflow and overflow. So let's do the bitwise and operator to find 5 and 6. So let's first write out 5. Uh, what is 5 in binary? Is it on this one? Nope, it's not on this one. Okay. Let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it should be, I'll just use 4 bits. And then 6 should be 0, 1, 1, 0. I think that's 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yep, this should be right. So the AND operator says that the resulting bit, if I do an AND operator, will lead to a 1 if and only if the top and bottom bits that align are the same, or well, specifically are ones. So one and zero is one, oh, I'm sorry, zero. Zero and one is also zero, and this is one. So this is zero, one, two, three, four. So it's five and six equals four. It's not math, you're not adding and subtracting, you're just comparing the two values, and if they're the same, or if they're both equal to one, it equals a one. If they're not the same, or if they're both false, then it's false, right? Both have to be true. In other words, both have to be ones, right? You will see this a lot when we do comparators on uh, uh, methods and loops and stuff like that later on down the road. Okay, if you made it this far, congratulations. You made it through the hardest and most boring part of the entire thing. Some of you may not see or understand why the hell we're doing half of this, but I promise you it will come together. If you remember in my first video, I asked you to just be patient. Suck it up, I guess, kind of. I don't want to really want to say that to you guys, but uh, just be patient. It's going to be boring for the first couple lessons. Uh, I'm trying not to use PowerPoint too much, but uh, if you have any questions, leave a comment or ask your question in the comments, and I'll try to respond to them. If there are so many questions that I need to kind of redo this, I will do so. But again, thanks. Bye.